It was the age of revolution, and the New World was in revolt against the reign of kings. The majority in Britain wanted to punish the Americans for their rebellious displays, such as their boycotts and their, uh, tea parties. However, there were a few that sympathized with the Americans. One of these men was Edmund Burke. Today we'll find out why Edmund Burke sympathized with his American cousins, and why, for Burke, the American Revolution succeeded where others had failed. I'm Christian Murray, and this is The Founders Club. Edmund Burke was born on January 12, 1729 in Dublin, Ireland, to a merchant-class Irish family with no great esteem. His father, Richard Burke, was a Protestant while his mother, Mary, was a Roman Catholic. Edmund Burke would follow his father's faith and become an Anglican, but this connection to his Roman Catholic mother would later raise questions about his loyalty to the British Crown. It also didn't help that he later married a Catholic woman named Mary Nugent. His parents having different religious beliefs, along with witnessing religious persecution and having Quaker friends, probably led to his beliefs on religious tolerance and nonviolence. This began his journey to see life as more complicated in practice than in theory. Burke would go on to attend a Quaker boarding school as a boy, and then move on to Trinity College in Dublin to study law, following his father's wishes. However, he would soon give up on law since he found it dull and became more fascinated with literature. He studied the classics along with philosophy and began writing his own works. He wrote A Vindication of Natural Society, A View of the Miseries and Evils Arising to Mankind, and A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origin of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful. That last work would earn Burke lasting fame, and associated him with philosophers such as Sir Joshua Reynolds and Samuel Johnson's circle. He also attracted attacks from the most prominent philosophers of the age, such as Hume and later Kant. Burke's main focus would not be philosophy though, rather politics would call his name and he would answer. In 1759, Burke began publishing the Annual Register in England, which published a yearly summary of British politics and included quite a bit of information about the American colonies. This could have made Burke one of the most well-informed men in Britain at the time on American affairs. In 1765, Lord Rockingham became Prime Minister of Great Britain and recognized Burke's talents. He appointed Burke to be his private secretary. From here, Burke would enter the House of Commons as a member of Parliament and would join the Rockingham faction of Whigs. This position gave him a unique opportunity to speak on the growing tension in America. During the 1760s, the colonists in America began to react negatively to the new taxes, acts, and restrictions that were being placed on them by Parliament and by the new king, King George III. After the Seven Years' War ended in 1763, which was a war started and fought in the American colonies, the British desperately needed money. The majority of Britain felt like the colonists should pay their fair share for their part of the war. Many also felt as if the colonies needed more oversight. Burke disagreed. He wasn't the only member of Parliament in this minority, though. If you remember from our William Pitt the Elder video, Pitt was against taxing America because he believed that there should be no taxation without representation, a sentiment that echoed the father of liberalism himself, John Locke. Burke did not fully oppose taxing and overseeing the colonies. Where Pitt and Locke were more liberal and abstract with their ideas, Burke was more conservative and concrete. To understand why Burke sympathized with his American cousins, and why he opposed these taxes and acts, we have to understand Burke's worldview. Edmund Burke did not believe in making politics or social issues as scientific or abstract as John Locke. It wasn't something that we could fully comprehend because it was way too complex for a limited understanding. Since it was so complex, he advised caution when it came to political theories, drastic government policies, social change, and even revolution. He writes, The science of government being therefore so practiced in itself and intended for such practical purposes, a matter which requires experiences and even more experiences than any person can gain in his whole life, however sagacious and observing he may be, 
It is with infinite caution that any man ought to venture upon putting down an edifice, which has answered in any tolerable degree, for ages, the common purposes, without having models and patterns of approved utility before his eyes. Burke believed that the only political or social structures that we could trust were the ones that were able to stand the test of time. History was something not to be overcome, but something to be respected. These traditional structures that were built throughout history, generation by generation worked for some incomprehensible reason, and that is why we should not trust scientific or abstract theories that drastically change it. Such changes could have dire consequences, and often did, as we will see later. In addition to this idea, he adds, as the ends of such a partnership cannot be obtained in many generations, it becomes a partnership not only between those who are living, but between those who are living, those who are dead, and those who are to be born. Each contract of each particular state is but a clause in the great primeval contract of eternal society. So not only should you not drastically change society because it could have effects that we can't even fathom, but society is governed by a social contract that spans through multiple generations. This means that no one generation has the right to break it. These were the reasons why Burke opposed taxing America. Burke supported the Americans because they were not the ones who broke this generational social contract, but rather it was the British. He believed that the British had the authority to tax America, but they should not do it because they have never taxed them until now. It breaks this social understanding that has historically worked between Britain and her colonies, and no one can fully understand what lies ahead by pursuing these policies. These thoughts would be laid out in many speeches given by Burke over the years, but we will focus on his speech in 1774 over American taxation and his speech in 1775 over conciliation with America because they contain the core of his arguments. Both speeches were given under Lord North's ministry, who decided to pursue harsher measures, which included removing American autonomy and rights that they felt entitled to as Englishmen. North's harsh measures only made things worse in America, which resulted in poorer relations between the Americans and the British. In Burke's speech over American taxation in 1774, he states, Again and again, revert to your old principles. Seek peace and ensue it. Leave America. If she has taxable matter in her, to tax herself. I am not here going into the distinctions of rights, nor attempting to mark their boundaries. I do not enter into these metaphysical distinctions. I hate the very sound of them. Leave the Americans as they anciently stood, and these distinctions, born of our unhappy contest, will die along with it. Here he refuses to adhere to abstract theory, as we discussed before, and wants the British to adhere to the traditions of the past. By taxing America and removing their autonomy, the British were drastically disrupting the American traditions of liberty and self-rule. He is essentially saying, if you want peace, let us do what we have always done before, and let the Americans be. Like his other speeches given before, no one actually listened to Burke. They decided to pursue harsher policies to punish the Americans for their rebellious displays. Burke made his most famous speech in 1775, called Conciliation with America. He wanted to make one last plea for Britain to make peace with the colonies before there was no going back. He states, from these six capital sources, of descent, of form of government, of religion in the northern provinces, of manners in the southern, of education, of the remoteness of situation from the first mover of government, from all these causes, a fierce spirit of liberty has grown up. It has grown up with the growth of the people in your colonies, and increased with the increase of their wealth, a spirit, than happily meeting with an exercise of power in England, which, however lawful, is not reconciliable to any ideas of liberty, much less with theirs, has kindled this flame that is ready to consume us. Even if the Americans identified themselves as Englishmen, Burke understood that the colonists were already a separate people, with their own unique sentiments and identity. They were, in their own opinion, what they thought Englishmen were. They imagined a liberty that actual Englishmen never possessed. Thus, in reality, they developed into something different. Americans. They did this to their own governments, religion, education, use of slavery, 
and place across the sea. Burke knew that if Britain used more force on the colonies, they would not respond like Brits, but as Americans. More force would only increase American resistance to British policies because of their developed love for liberty and their own unique identity. Burke believed that any more drastic measures would lead to war in America, a war that would be impossible for Britain to win. He believed that it would be an absolute waste to lose such a valuable gem like America over stupid abstract policies that had never been tried before. Burke believed that they should implement his policies in order to reconcile the two people and give the Americans what they want. These policies included letting the Americans having their own legislatures, allowing them to tax themselves, and repealing many British policies that had been used to punish America. He emphasized that his own policies were based on experience with America and its history. Of course, he was ignored for more drastic policies, and just a month later, the American Revolution began. It's no surprise that Burke was right on the outcome of the war, and in 1783, the United States was officially recognized as an independent country. Burke would be loved by Americans for his support during the buildup of the revolution, and Burke even dined with a few patriots such as Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Paine. Burke would later support the American Constitution, not because of any new liberal theories or abstract ideas of rights found within it, but because it did what good governments do. It reflected the national character of its people and its history. Even though Edmund Burke lost every political battle he fought, he seemed to be right every single time. Ironically, history, the thing he loved to adhere to, would vindicate him. It's strange that a man who absolutely despised revolution, which typically ends in failure, would sympathize with the Americans when they revolted. So why in the world was America the exception? Well, for Burke, the American Revolution wasn't actually a revolution at all. For Burke, it was more of a reformation. You see, a revolution sweeps away old structures of government and society in favor of theoretical new ones. That is not what the Americans did in Burke's eyes. What the Americans were doing was going against British policies that were trying to change the status quo by trying to get back their American traditions. This brings us to today's question. Do you agree with Burke? Do you think it was more of an American Reformation rather than an American Revolution? Let us know what you guys think in the comments below. In our next episode, we will see what Burke has to say about the revolution in France, something that he deemed more of a revolution than what happened in America. Well, that's all we have for today, so if you like this video, hit that like button. If you like the channel and want to become a Founders Club member, hit that subscribe button. And remember, history's a good story that needs to be told. So tell it.